Good evening, this is Toshio Okada, and today is January 21st. So today, oh, good evening, good evening, okay. Yes, it's already the end of January, and I've been thinking like, oh, a month goes so fast. Today, I'll talk about The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is in a style of a famous Japanese TV show, Buddha Tamori. I'll explain the landscapes of the game Zelda. It'll take up most of the lecture today, so I'll chit chat a little in the beginning and at the end. First of all, let me talk about this week's Pop Team Epic, although I'm not sure if it is really popular or not. Some of you may think, don't talk about that, talk about the Netflix version of Devilman. But to me, Pop Team Epic is more important. You can watch a Devilman type of series anytime, but Pop Team Epic is like a limited season snack. So, Pop Team Epic first. Well, but still, I found out that more people praise Devilman than I expected. I do understand why some people think it's good, so I'll talk a little about that as well. I also want to talk about how I recommend another Netflix series called Black Mirror. More than Devilman. I mean, its fourth season is insane. Do you guys know about it? Later, I'll do an evaluation seminar lecture about how some cartoonists are protesting against the emerging free comic book websites that the free service can make them starve. And some cartoonists have even made cartoons for the protest. So, I'll talk about how we should interpret this type of problem. So, how should we start? Hmm. Well, I'm looking at the comments and many people are writing, No, I don't know, I don't know, I've never watched Black Mirror. So, why don't I start by talking about Black Mirror? Well, Netflix is broadcasting the series and it's on season 4. The story resembles Twilight Zone, or maybe Ultra Q, if I think of any Japanese drama. Every story completes in just one episode. They're mysterious and have different characters. So the fourth season has started recently on Netflix. Someone just asked, can I start watching from season 4? Yes, you can! Not only that, the reason I recommend season 4 is because the first three seasons have both good and bad episodes. And one or two episodes in each season are terrible that make you think, oh wow, that was boring. But all episodes in season 4 are good. My recommendation is the first episode. So, it's titled USS Callister. Now, what's the best way to introduce this episode? Well, so, this is a scene from the episode. So, this looks exactly like Star Trek. And what that means is that... So, it's a story about the world in the future. And the woman in the front of the picture is the main character. And she enters a VR game company. The reason she enters the company is because she admired her boss called Daily. But he always looks timid. And everyone at the company looks down on him. Meanwhile, there is a CEO who is clever and good looking. Daily makes all the games, but the handsome CEO appears in the media and acts like he's all that. If you imagine the relationship between Steve Jobs and Wozniak, you'll get the idea. However, to our surprise, that wimpy looking boss named Daily is actually a very bad guy. He secretly collects the DNA of everyone he hates at the company. After work, he samples saliva from the edge of used coffee cups with swabs, takes them home, and sequences them on a DNA sequencer at his house.
I mean, running a DNA sequencer at home isn't really that scientific, but anyway. Then, whoever he samples the DNA from gets taken to the world of the unpublished VR game which Daily has created as the game characters. The world is designed exactly like the spaceship in Star Trek, and Daily, who is always acting timid at the company, is called Captain Daily there. <laughs> Everyone has to look at him enviously when he comes into the control room and calls his name. The control room is filled with his colleagues who always make fun of him at work, but here everyone respects him. For example, when an enemy like Klingon from Star Trek attacks, they panic, but Captain Daly commands strongly, shoot photon torpedoes. There, that bad CEO is the adjutant, and he's acting as a foil to Daly. The CEO goes, we're done, let's surrender, but everything works under Captain Daly's strong commands. Then the CEO says, you were right, Captain Daly, I was wrong, and Daly sits on him like a chair and acts arrogantly. This is the first episode. When I first saw this, as soon as the new season began, I thought they'd gone mad because the very first scene of this episode is the control room with the digital alert going off. Captain Daly comes in through the automatic door and says, show me the monitor. The setting is obviously insane, but that was Daly's virtual reality. Now, the main character woman enters the company, then she... Yeah, this woman. Then she... Oh, it was the other one. After she enters the company as a new recruit, Daily likes her, but she quickly gets sucked into the mainstream group that the CEO leads. So Daily hates her, seals her DNA, and forces her into the game as science officer, who is like Mr. Spock in Star Trek. Once they are taken into that world, because they are just digital clones made from the DNA sampled from saliva, they can't get out of that world. They can't even kill themselves. On top of that, there's a rule that every time Captain Daly succeeds the mission at the end of the story, all female members have to French kiss him. <laughs> so the main character lady goes, that's sick, hell no. But that upsets Captain Daly, so he says, no, you don't get your situation, do you? And snaps his finger. Then, her face instantly, I mean, because this is his world. She instantly loses her eyes, nose, and mouth, and suffocates and collapses. So, while she suffers, Daily says, painful? That's what you get for disobeying me. This is actually a complete homage to a 1960s TV show called Twilight Zone, written by Rod Serling. There's an episode in Twilight Zone called It's a Good Life. It's about a small countryside village in the farthest reaches of America, where there is only one house and people living there live in fear. A person who visits the house wonders, why? But later finds out that a boy has a supernatural power and can make anything happen as he wishes. So, people who are gathered there have to pretend to be his parents or brothers and sisters and listen to whatever he orders. Now, in the 1980s, John Landis and Steven Spielberg produced that TV series into a feature film with the same title, Twilight Zone. In this movie, directed by Joe Dante, uh, so it was a remake of It's a Good Life, and there's a scene where the boy uses his supernatural power to take away a mouth from her older sister for saying unpleasant things to him. So, this scene in USS Callister with a featureless face is a complete homage to that episode. I saw it and thought, oh, I get it. They're doing Twilight Zone here, which was interesting. Now, back to the story of Black Mirror. Because the inside, the spacecraft, is imitating the world of Star Trek, everyone has a sound mind. Someone just wrote on the comment, why only a kiss? But there's a reason for that. That's because no one in Star Trek, which Daily loves, has sex. So when Daily leaves the room, the crew members all drink alcohol and bitch endlessly. A guy says, we can't even kill ourselves, look, and pulls down his underwear, and no one has a penis or nipples. They complain, we have to live in daily sound world, I'd rather die. 
Then, the rest of the story is about how they fight back against Captain Daly. A good plot, isn't it? Each episode features different stories in a similar taste. I think they're pretty interesting, so I recommend you watch Black Mirror, available on Netflix. Now I'm done with my first topic. Okay, now, I don't know how much time it's going to take, so we shouldn't wait so long. Um, let's get started on Zelda. Oh, but before I start, I want to do a questionnaire. I want to know how many of you have played it, or are not going to play it. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Number one, I'm not going to play it. Two, I'm thinking about it. Three, I'm playing it right now. And four, I finished it. Okay, please pick one and let's see the result. I heard you don't need to have a Switch to play it, since it's also available on Wii U. But anyway. Okay, now the result, please. Oh, wow, half of you are not going to play it, but 20% are thinking about it, I see. But I'm actually surprised to see 10% have finished it. 10% <laughs> of you finished? Wow, amazing audience. Well, I mean, I'm just like, wow, amazing. Okay, so... Now, I'm targeting this lecture to those who aren't going to play it as well. That's why you don't need to know anything about what kind of game Zelda is. This is Buddha Zelda. It's like how you can enjoy Japanese history when you watch Buddha Tamori without any background knowledge, just by looking at the archaeological sites. Today, rather than talking about how fun Zelda is as a game, I'll focus more on how you can see the world of Zelda to enjoy it more. So, last December, I talked about how I enjoyed hiking or physical phenomena in Zelda, which was more from the perspective of playing the game. And when I announced today's lecture last week, I was planning to talk about the sci-fi aspect of Zelda. For example, there are enemy robots in the game called Guardians. If you flip it, you'll know that the image source is Kain Shiki Doki, or flame-shaped earthen vessel, from the Jomon period. And I believe that it was inspired by that aircraft in Naushka. I mean... Dorok's flying pot. I think the designers of Zelda took inspiration from this. And this... thing. Well, it's the actual picture of the Jomon vessel. Well, Miyazaki is impressive for using these types of Japanese images in such a straightforward manner to develop his sci-fi or fantasy worlds, while a lot of Japanese creators would just make them look Western when they make a sci-fi or fantasy. Zelda took a step further and flipped the vessel upside down, giving it legs, which I think is a smart idea. If I talk about Zelda as a sci-fi, I'll be talking about this type of stuff. But that kind of lecture ends up being targeted only at those who played Zelda as a game. That's why I think I should take a different approach. And that's because unlike movies, it's hard to talk about the themes in depth when it comes to a media like game. I talked about Raputa in the last two lectures, but I can talk like that about movies. There are so many hidden themes and messages that the viewers may not realize in movies because they can have profound themes. But games can elaborate their themes. Instead, they can narrow down their storytelling. What I mean by that is, for example, when Miyazaki made Raputa, he first planned to plot the movie based solely on Pazu's perspective. That would limit scenes, and the story would only be based on Pazu's experience. But there's a limit to that kind of movie-making method. But games can make the players experience their worlds by narrowing down what to tell or show. It's the same for Zelda and Dragon Quest. Most stories and scenes are from the first-person views of the main character, who's also the player. That's what I mean by storytelling becomes narrow. They can't switch scenes easily like movies. Because the main characters have to physically go to the next scene in games, they only get a limited view of the world. The good thing is, because of that, games can provide a strong experience. I'll touch on this more later. で
Now, what I think is, games may be Miyazaki's ideal way of creation. Because before, Miyazaki tried to incorporate computer graphics into movie making. And later, he stopped that and went back to hand-drawn animation. But if Miyazaki wants to do what he originally planned in Raputa, he should make games. His game can be about anything, but if he makes one, he can focus his storytelling on the growth of the main character by narrowing down what to show based on their first-person view. It will give Miyazaki a chance to make something new again, and that is going to make a great impact on the world. It'll show us the next creative step, not only in the animation industry, but the entire movie industry, and what kind of experience they can offer to people. That's why I thought Miyazaki should create a game. As for my own lecture, I thought it would be more interesting to talk about Zelda with a wider perspective than treat it just as a sci-fi. And if we combine Zelda with Hayao Miyazaki, we start seeing it as Naushika. It's a world where a hundred years have passed since Naushika departed. Imagine 100 years later, the holy Dorok Emperor comes back to life as a giant monster in order to erase the entire human race. Princess Zelda, who is a descendant of Naushka, is captured inside Tomekia Palace and cannot escape from there. Meanwhile, the main character boy named Link wakes up with all his memories wiped out. If you think like that, things become very easy to understand. Now, the important part of Zelda is, uh, how should I say, hmm, it's the great battle 100 years ago, but I'll talk about the background before I get to it. But the reason I can talk about Zelda like this is because I've already finished the game like some of you. It's a viewpoint you can only have after finishing the game, because while you are playing, you can only think about how to win in each stage. You just go through all the archaeological sites and get the items without stopping because you want to finish the game as fast as possible. It's kind of like how you travel abroad to overseas archaeological sites, but you end up only spending time at a duty-free shop. Or, it's like how you are going to those sites, but just spend time at photo shoot locations. And when you're done, you just buy the souvenirs. That's what happens when you try to finish a game. But Zelda is not that kind of game. It's something you have to read into, like movies and anime, or more than movies and anime, even deeper. So, some of you may think that I'll spoil the ending, but don't worry, it's because you will never come across these ideas while you're playing the game. <laughs> I even wish I could play it for the first time with the knowledge that I have now. <laughs> So, if you haven't played it yet, you should listen to my lecture before starting the game. Otherwise, you'll play it like any other game. By doing so, you can only enjoy less than one-tenth of how its world was conceptualized by Nintendo staff. So, my lecture on Zelda today will be your background knowledge. I'm pretty confident it'll do you good, but I'll still only talk about two topics since some of you may still be worried about the spoiler. I'll talk about the miracle of Fort Hateno and defending Akala Citadel, these two. 10% of you should know what I'm going to talk about, but I'll talk about the miracle that happened at Fort Hateno and the battle to defend Akala Citadel. I'll treat these two events like real history, as if they actually happened. As I mentioned earlier, the most interesting part of Zelda is the battle 100 years ago. So, in the great battle of 100 years ago, first, there was Princess Zelda, and there was Link, who is a super swordsman, and the four heroes who controlled the giant robots. They were all fighting together. The whole team was there at that time. The villain's side also had Ganon, who had returned, the giant robots whom the villains took control of, and killing machines like Guardians. Guardians 
weapons are huge and they shoot beams from their eyes. So they're so strong. So think of them as the giant warriors. Thousands of giant warriors coming out, attack humans and destroy the civilized world. But all of this only appears in the game as history, although this battle should make the best scenes out of all events. It's like the climax scene in Naushka, where a giant warrior comes back to life and fights Om, who charged from far away. It takes your breath away, but in Zelda, that kind of event finished a hundred years ago. What's great about Zelda is that it doesn't focus on depicting those scenes. Because if you look around, there have been so many games with outstanding visual images. They all try to show cool images. However, games can't beat movies if they only try to show cool images. And that's because movies can show images along with the progression of stories which can move the audience more. So, in terms of creating emotions through images, games can't beat movies. So, if games try to impress the players through images, they end up being like an unsuccessful Hollywood movie. So, what Zelda did was that it eliminated all great images. The game sets the best episodes as past events and lets the player start with the main character Link, who doesn't remember anything at all. I think that's the most appropriate approach for a game, as a media, that provides experience. As I said earlier, games have to extremely narrow down what they show and tell, instead, so they can provide experience. Movies provide images, while games provide experience. Because of this unique nature of games, the players can experience 100 years ago realistically without seeing the images. <laughs> That's why when you hear Zelda talk to Link at the climax scene, you are completely blown away by what she says. Because at first you think of her just as a character in a game. But as you run, walk, cook, hunt beasts with arrows, eat them, fight the bad guys and so on inside the game, Zelda becomes more than just a game character. When you see her at the climax scene, you think, I meet you at last. That's how this game succeeds in providing experience. And that's why this light conversation with Princess Zelda at the end gets to your heart so heavily. Oh, you'll be moved. Now, let's talk about what I actually experienced while I played the game. So, the story begins 100 years ago. Um, how should I start? Let me stand up. Sorry, let me set this up. So, it's about a hundred years ago. Can you see? This is Hyrule Castle. By the way, this is the map of the game. The real map is a lot larger than this. This is only two-thirds of the entire map. So, here's Hyrule Castle. This castle has been ruled by a villain called Ganon for a hundred years. 100 years ago, there was a prophecy that Ganon was coming back to life, so people prepared to fight him, but they lost. So, back then, Hyrule Castle prepared to defend against the foreign enemies. They were in good diplomatic terms with the satellite states, while preparing to fight against overseas enemy states by building a fortress like Akala Citadel as the final defense line. So they built an impenetrable fortress and got ready to protect their kingdom. And Hyrule Castle itself uh, was surrounded by a natural stronghold. These are all mountains. And the castle was located in a valley surrounded by the mountain range, so the castle could create a strong defense line. But they were vulnerable to an attack from the inside because Ganon attacked from inside the castle after he resurrected. That's why thousands of soldiers had to abandon the castle and escape. Not only the soldiers, but all the citizens of Hyrule who lived in the castle town or the villages around the castle also had to evacuate. Now, thousands of royal family members 
and the groups of cavalry escaped from Hyrule Castle and they moved a little south went this way cut through Romani Plain and crossed the bridge this road is not maintained, but thousands of soldiers ran through this road, took a route like this, and finally... Sorry, I'm being clumsy. So, finally, they took this winding path. Went up toward this ridge. This is the fortress. It's called Akala Citadel. And this is the escape route. Because they were attacked, they first escaped into the valley, fought their way through this road, and ran into this fortress. Meanwhile, this is the path that Link and Princess Zelda took. I mean, everyone escaped, but the civilians didn't escape from the castle. Everyone moved away from the entire valley. Went through this narrow road. And here, do you see these contour lines crowded together? These two places, these are called the dueling peaks, where you can walk through the crack. They're like a natural fortress, and you see these crowded contour lines? What's amazing about Zelda is that these contour lines all represent the real landscapes in the game. They go through a naturally made road between these steep mountains. Here you go and move to a place called Blatchery Plain. If you come this far, here you go, you reach Fort Hateno. So they escape there. Okay, let me go through the whole process again. Ganon returned and occupied Hyrule Castle. And here, tens and hundreds of thousands of killer robots, like the giant warriors from Naushka, spread throughout the entire country. The army went through this yellow line and ran into the undefeated Akala Citadel, which was the final defense line. Meanwhile, Princess Zelda and Link went down south with the civilians who were running about, trying to escape between the mountains, across Blatchery Plain, and into Fort Hateno. That's the overview. Okay, let me sit down again. Someone asked, is the crack in the Dueling Peaks a fault? I think there was a super advanced ancient civilization from more than 10,000 years ago in the world of Zelda, which we aren't aware of. The crack looks artificially made with a beam weapon or something from that time. It looks like you can almost put them back into one piece without any gap. So it looks too clean to be an active fault, but the game doesn't explain it at all. Now, Link and Zelda went down south with the civilians through the road between the peaks and across Blatchery Plain. They took that path because the narrow road kept them from being surrounded by the enemies. Zelda is a great game because this all happened 100 years ago. That's why you see those corrupted robots that have turned into relics all over the place. I first saw them and just thought, oh, there are many of them. But after I finished the game and walked around the place more comfortably, I could tell that it was a battlefield. The narrow road was vulnerable to their attacks from the sides. So was the plane, because there were no places to escape to. That's where they fought. You can tell how they fought, for example, by looking at guardians with their legs cut. 
they were defeated by Link's sword. On the other hand, those who were defeated by Zelda's supernatural power had all their arms and legs, but they were dead upside down. You get a clear view of what kind of fight they had or the enemies they killed. This is how you enjoy Zelda like you enjoy Buratamori. The relics are not props that the game designers put in randomly to create the atmosphere. They are extremely carefully designed and deployed. Because they are not just the background, you can read into them. And what you can read from them is so interesting. Now, Link and others went through the narrow mountain path between the dueling peaks to protect themselves from the enemies. But once they got to the large, blatchery plain, they couldn't escape a battle, and Link used up all his strength and died. This is 100 years ago. That's because... Oh, it's okay. This is not a spoiler because they'll tell you Link died like 10 seconds after the game starts. A large group of guardians attacked all at once when Link and others got out of the narrow path between the dueling peaks and to the large plain. Link was bringing up the rear to fight the enemies who had approached from the back, so he was defenseless against the ones waiting in the plain. On the other hand, because of Link's sacrifice, the civilians could manage to run into Fort Hateno. While there was no army to fight with him, and Princess Zelda couldn't use her supernatural power yet, Link was the only one who could properly fight the enemies who chased after them. Thanks to Link, the people could miraculously run into the fortress. This is what I call the miracle of Fort Hateno. You can tell how miraculous this escape was by looking at all the corrupted guardians remaining in Blatchery Plain and the ruins of the towns and villages. You'll think, so there was a colony here until 100 years ago. That's why there's a road. Because there was a town in this location, there is a road here. You can find that out by walking. But again, I didn't have any clue while I was playing. I only had shallow thoughts like, oh, it's a convenient road to ride the horse, or oh, there's a ruin there, maybe I can find a treasure. But I couldn't help it because I was trying to finish the game then. But after I was done, I walked around different places and I started realizing, oh, this was actually a remarkable place. All the fierce battles took place here. Link fought here alone, and the civilians had to fight here as well. There are many ruins that indicate such history. For example, there are like tree branches all over the place around the wrecks of guardians, which you can use as weapons. When I first saw them, I wasn't surprised. I just thought, eh, they won't make a strong weapon. But seeing them all over the place means that when the civilians passed through there, they had to fight too. It gave me a chill. So, the Swordsman Link and Princess Zelda fought in Blatchery Plain to protect the civilians, but Link used up all his power there and collapsed. Then, finally Princess Zelda, who was in despair, used her concealed power. Blatchery Plain still remains in the present time of the game. If you go there, you'll see a vast land extending out to the horizon beyond Fort Hateno, which is covered by numerous wrecks of guardians. All you can see are their dead bodies. You see thousands of them all the way to the horizon. But when you're in the middle of playing the game, you think, no, there are so many of them, please stay dead, maybe I'll find some items. After the game is over, when you have the entire plot in your head, you think back and realize that it was a hard-fought battlefield. Then you understand that because people survived that battle, now there's Hateno village near Fort Hateno. And the country is finally starting to restore after a hundred years, and the idea really sinks into your mind. Just imagine Princess Zelda using her amazing final power to defeat all the guardians who had spread out to the horizon. Something extraordinary happened at that time and um, hold on and it was 
a week ago that I finished the game, but after that, I basically just kept walking around different archaeological sites. And I wasn't thinking about any of these until I finished the game. Like I said, I just thought, oh, these are just item objects that the designers randomly deployed. I was also scared while I was trying to finish the game that the monsters might attack me. So instead of looking around carefully, I usually ran straight to the next destination. I just thought, it'll be annoying to have monsters waiting for me at the ruins, or I hope there's a treasure box there. But once I finished the game and started walking around those sites, I started noticing many things. For example, Fort Hateno, where the civilians escaped into, isn't really a fortress. It's just a checkpoint. There is only a four to five meter tall rampart made of stone, and even that short stone rampart has collapsed. And someone filled in the collapsed parts with a simple wooden fence. Because after the battle with Guardians 100 years ago, the rampart broke, but the country no longer had any power to restore it. That's why all they could do was to make up the broken wall with a simple wooden fence, but it can only block bandits. And actually, monsters dwell in Blatchery Plain, but because the gate at the ridge is kept open, they can go in and out freely. Humans already retreated from Blatchery Plain. That's why there is Hateno Village on top of a mountain far beyond Fort Hateno. It means humans had to retreat that far in order to live. What you see in the present time of the game is the land that is no longer in the human world, although the monsters are not ruling humans anymore. If you see the rampart of Fort Hateno, you can also find lots of dead guardians who were killed while trying to climb up the wall. So, if Princess Zelda's supernatural power awakened a few seconds late, perhaps Fort Hateno would have been destroyed and the world behind the fort entirely invaded by the enemies. But, the game doesn't explain this at all. Some minor characters in the game, like random old men and women who are strolling around here and there, sometimes tell you fragments of what happened a long time ago, but they still don't tell you the whole story. But, you can see it. If you look around from the top of the cliffs, if you stand on top of Fort Hateno and look down, you can use your Buratamori imagination and realize what happen. For example, so let me explain using the map again. Please look here. There's a strange looking road right here. It's off the road. It's in the shape of an oval. You see that? There is an area called Ovli Plain in the southwest. There's a mysterious road that only circles, but there's no reason whatsoever. There's a shack nearby, but there's no way anyone can live there. I walked around that road. Then I realized that there were some strange billboards. It looks like a street sign, and they were in different colors. Those billboards had concentric circular patterns. I wondered what they were and realized that they were targets of bows and arrows. So, the reason why the road was circular was because it was an archery range for Yabusame, the Japanese art of shooting arrows on horseback. Just to make sure, I shot one of the targets with my arrow and it exploded, so I was certain that it was a target. And the only explanation of this place is that it was an archery range for Yabusame. Also, that shack didn't look like a house, so I guessed that maybe it was a stable. So I went in there and I saw the floor was not made of wood, but an earth floor. So I thought, it's a stable. Now, when I walked back to the junction of the road, I found a really old street sign there. I read the decayed sign. It said, Hateno village is that way, and the horse riding ground is this way. I read it and finally confirmed that my theory was correct. That was an archery range, and they used to have a culture similar to Yabusame, but it died out 100 years ago.
You can find so many of this type of historical remnant in the world of Zelda. All the archaeological sites and towns around them in normal RPGs would be randomly placed without any meaning. But Zelda is amazing because the creators took the concept to the next level where these remnants teach us what happened in these sites 100 years ago and why they remain like they do. It's amazing to find out that each archaeological site and ruin are extremely well thought out as I just described. Now, let's go back to the story about Fort Hateno. There's a cliff on top of Fort Hateno. When you climb it and glance over, you see Blatchery Plain, which was the final battlefield of the defense line, extending out and see numerous dead guardian robots on the field. Beyond that, you see the dueling peaks rising to the sky with a narrow road in between. You see the peaks and think, because they stopped the attack of guardians, Link could protect his people, although sacrificing his life. You can now think that because of this topographical advantage, Link could continue fighting and sympathize with him on how tough his fight was, as all the knights and soldiers had headed to Akala Citadel to protect the kingdom. Now, let me talk about the game design or what Nintendo intended to do in this game. The name of the director is Hidemaro Fujibayashi. Doesn't it sound elegant? So, he said in an interview that he used the map of Kyoto in order to have the sense of distance in the game. Since the headquarters of Nintendo are located in Kyoto, it was easier for them. Fujibayashi walked around Kyoto with his staff to measure how large the map would be compared to the moving performance of Link. He also said that they pasted Google map photos onto the images of the game and estimated the walking distance to Nijo Castle or how far it would take to walk from Kyoto Imperial Palace until you started seeing Kyoto Tower. And there's a person who recreated it. And the name of the person is... Hobita-san. So I borrowed the image from his blog called Hobby Report. This is what Nintendo probably did as well. So, you see how Zelda is designed after the city of Kyoto. Then, Goron City would be equivalent to Mount Hie, and the sea beyond that would actually be Lake Biwa. That's how they designed the world of Zelda. Now, there are towers in Zelda called Sheikah Towers. Sheikah Towers are super ancient towers that suddenly rose from the earth after Link awakened and now overlook the entire world. Remember how Fujibayashi said he had estimated how far he needed to walk from Kyoto Imperial Palace to be able to see Kyoto Tower? Of course, Sheikah Towers are inspired by Kyoto Tower. <laughs> then, what inspired Kyoto Tower? That space needle in Seattle. Like this, if you know where each design came from, things become so much more interesting. So Space Needle was built for the Seattle World Expo that was hosted around 1965. Then it became Kyoto Tower in the 1980s. Then it got a new life in a Nintendo game. Isn't that interesting? So, the message from me to those of you who haven't played the game yet is you can treat it as a story in Japan. Say Nobunaga Oda and Taira no Masakado come back to the modern time as monsters and burn the entire kinky region. They also steal the four sacred beasts, Suzaku, Genmu, Byako, and Seiryu. The main character awakens at the Emperor Nintoku Mausoleum or Sakevat Rock in Nara and travels from one Jomon archaeological site to another and fights the enemy as he tries to unseal ancient super civilizations. Zelda is that kind of domestic story. It's not about a continent or a large country. It's a small-scale story about the age of civil wars in Japan. This is in Nara, but we don't know what this was made for. It's an archaeological site called Sakafuna Ishi, or Stone Vat Rock.
Ah, it's this way. Sorry, that's the name of the site. And this is also an important design inspiration for the world of Zelda. Uh, Zelda took the designs from this, as well as the flame-shaped earthen vessel that I mentioned earlier. That's why it's not a story that involves a continent. Its scale is closer to the age of civil wars in Japan. If you imagine the Japanese TV series, Sanada Maru, you'll have a good sense of how large Hyrule Kingdom is, and know how small the country is, as it doesn't occupy the entire continent. It's like one Japanese province with this kind of mountain and this type of archaeological site. So, Hyrule Kingdom has been fully prepared to fight against the neighbor countries, which is symbolized by Akala Citadel, an invincible fortress constructed near the east coast of the continent as an absolute defense line. 100 years ago, there was a magnificent battle that lasted until the very last night of the royal family died. So, I'm done with the miracle of Fort Hateno, and now I'll move on to the next topic, which is the tragic battle at Akala Citadel, which you can't watch without tears. But, it's already 45 minutes, so let's finish the free part here. Now, the questionnaire. In the second half, let's talk about the tragic battle of Akala Citadel, then I'll do the rest of the chit-chats about other topics. Okay. All right, total 80% satisfaction, pretty good. Anyway, folks, let's play Zelda. <laughs> it's very, very good. I rarely compliment games like this, really. Now, let's move on to the second half. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous otaku king in Japan, otaku king Toshio Okada. I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese. So please look forward to it. If you ask a, com a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture, and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies. So please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.